Last summer, I took the opportunity to see the British inland waterways from a different perspective. A narrowboat journey up the Birmingham Worcester Canal, hung a right onto the Stratford, another right out onto the River Avon, and then a final right back up the River Severn. It presented an amazing picture of literally thousands of anglers passed at a steady three miles per hour. And I wished I was selling DVDs and hot dogs to such a mass of pegs. Many of these anglers were match fishing. And as competition numbers increase in relation to popularity of course fishing matches, any new information that can help you increase your chances of winning has to be utilised. In this programme, we're going to pay attention to one of the world's top match anglers, former world champion Tom Pickering. These are some of Tom's best tips for both individual and team approaches to match angling on canals. I hope they work for you. If you were to ask me what I like about fishing, there's quite a few things. I enjoy the environment, enjoy the fresh air, enjoy catching fish. I think there's something good about having a challenge of something that I can't see in that water and trying to catch it. I think that's a terrific challenge. More importantly, me as a person, I'm very competitive. I like to win. And one of the things I like to do, whether it's team fishing, individual fishing, I like to win. I don't like coming second. If you were to ask me if I were coming second, in every match I could ever fish, I'd probably pack in because I enjoy the, the competitiveness of winning. So if I'm in a team competition, I expect to win. If I'm in individually, I expect to win every time I go fishing. I don't, of course, I don't always win, but I always think that, that when you're going fishing, you must think positively about winning a competition, whether it's a team or individual. I'm sat on the Newell Junction Canal. Around Doncaster, we've got a tremendous amount of canal systems, up to 30 miles, and within 10 or 15 minutes, I can be on any of them sections. We have a tremendous amount of matches on them, some teams, some individual. So I fish a series of both. But both team and individual are different styles of fishing. Team fishing, I might be fishing chop worm, I might be fishing squat most of the time. I might be trying to catch a eel on the long pole. Individual fishing, I don't none of those. Because I don't think you can win by squat fishing and chop worm fishing. So let's get stuck in. What I'll show you now is the techniques I'm going to adopt and the way I'm going to fish to win a competition. So let's get on with it and try and win the match. The first thing we do when we get to his peg is mix his ground bait. And what, that depends on which part of the canal system I'm going to. If I'm on the Keeby end of the canal, I'll be mixing two, which will be a, a bream ground bait and a roach ground bait. If I'm on the New Junction Canal, from the low numbers, again, I'll probably mix a bream ground bait. But the rest of it, I'll just be mixing one ground bait, which will be a roach type ground bait. Even when we're fishing a match to win, and on a positive way, I still want a bombardment of ground bait on my pole line. On this canal, ropes respond to ground bait, providing you've got the right mix, and I'm going to show you what the correct mix is in a, in a minute. So it's important that when you put your ground bait in, it's important that you put the right one in so that the ropes do respond and come onto it. If you don't put ground bait in, you just lose feed. Over the last couple of years, that's not worked as well as the ground, as the ground bait. And what happens is the fish then will go to the anglers near you that have put the ground bait in. So even if the fish don't come onto the ground bait, you can fish a little bit further out away from it. At least you're giving your option of doing both. So if I'm going to mix a roach ground bait, the one I use at the moment, which is very popular and works very, very well, is this. 25% is super cup. Everything on this canal, whether it's roach or bream, is based around super cup. It is the best ground bait on the canal. 25% of the, of the mix is that. 25% is super match. That's a very nice ro roach ground bait. It's got hemp in. It's a darkish coloured mix. The canal is quite clear at a lot of times, and I think you want a bit darker mix, and that helps it go a bit darker. The two other types that we put in the mix is one is brown bread crumb, just gives it a bit more air, it gives it a bit more oils, and it actually makes you know makes it work in the peg a little bit better. But the one that will surprise a few people is damp lean. We actually put damp lean into the mix, and what that does, it makes it hold on the bottom. Because the canal tolls quite a lot one way and then it'll go still again, then it'll toll and go the other way. We need something with some body in it that'll hold on the bottom, and that's what lean does. So each of them four, we put 25% of each into a mix. When you put the four in, just mix it together like so in a round bowl. All the shoes are round bowl, not a square one. Just mix it round like so, so you get a nice texture and get it all mixed in nicely. Now because 
This ground bait, you don't need to add a lot of water, you'd be surprised. Because if you put too much water in it, it becomes very stodgy. So what you want to do is just keep adding a little bit of water at a time, just a little bit like so, and then turn it round. Because if you, if you make it too stodgy, you defeat the object of all the oils and everything working in the ground bait. You want a, a fairly dry mix that will bind and hold together. So just mix it gently, and then when you think you've got it all nicely separated, just one squeeze to see if it holds. That don't quite hold enough at the moment. So what I do is just add a little bit more water, not a lot, just a little bit like so, and just keep doing it gradual. Don't chuck a load in at start and, and spoil it before you get finished. So all we're going to do is do that. Just keep stirring it round and round and give it a, a thorough mix like so. Just one squeeze, and then when it holds nicely like so, and then crumbles gently, that's about perfect. Now what you might find is you might, just before you start fishing, because you do this the first thing when you get to, to bank, is you might just have to add a little bit more water, but you can just squeeze it like so to make sure that it holds. When that hits the bottom, it will just spread out gently. And that's, that's a nice mix there, that works pretty well at the moment. When I'm fishing positive, I fish for bream and chub at the start. So it's important that I get the setups absolutely right. And they can be different on the different parts of the canal that I'm going to be fishing. If I'm on the Kiwi section, or I'm on the lower numbers on the New Junction when I'm fishing for bream, then it's a little bit different to the chub sections. That's on the terminal tattle. On the main tattle, like the rod, the rod is 11 foot 6, soft to medium action. It's the same rod for both occasions. And I find that you don't want a rod too, too strong because what you find out, if you use a strong rod, you have to use strong lines and that means you have to use thicker hooks. That means you don't get as many bites and as many fish. You've got to give yourself a chance of getting a bite and then landing the fish. The reel, I like a twist buster reel for the simple reason it takes all the twists and the turns out of the hook length and you get no ravels on your round top, uh, top ring of your feeder rod, which I think is quite important. I use a three pound main line, which I think is about right. Some people use four, I think three pound is about right. Then down to the nitty gritty end of the action. If I'm fishing for bream, what I find out is I use an open ended feeder. And, but I do, I do just change this a little bit for normal ways. I use a medium feeder, it's got a little bit of weight in it, a bit more than normal, because I find that with the canal towing one way, then towing the other way, I find that you need to hold the bottom when, when it's towing. If you have too little lead on, what happens is your tip, tip keeps dropping back, and you find out you keep striking, you're thinking that the bites and it's the actual tow that's doing it. You need something that'll just go in and just hold even when it's towing. I do modify it a little bit by putting a bit of power gum in between the swivel, and the feeder. I find that that's quite important. It just takes a little bit of shock and I just think it, just think it works pretty nice. Now the hook length is, for bream fishing, is an 010. I always fix it to my main line by a loop to loop. I find that that is the best knot. A lot of people use half a blood knot onto a loop. Now if you do that, stop doing it this very instant and go to loop to loop because it is a stronger knot. And if you use half a blood knot onto a loop, you'll be surprised how weak that knot actually is. Two and a half, two and a half foot hook length to a size 22 Team England maggot hook. I find that that is a nice hook for bream fishing. It's not a strong hook, but it's not a weak hook. It's an in-between one, and it works pretty well. I wouldn't dream of using that for chub fishing, but for bream fishing, that is a nice hook. And that's a basic setup. Six inch link to the feeder, and a two and a half foot hook length to the hook. And I find that that is a nice setup for fishing for bream. Because there's so many things we can do on the canal, when you're fishing to win the competition and uh, you're in an attacking mode, what happens is that you perhaps start on the feeder or the waggler across and you might catch an odd fish here and there, an odd chub maybe with a bit of luck. But usually, uh, some part of the day, you'll be fishing for roach on the long pole. And that is quite important. You put a bomb you're going to put a bombardment to ground bait in, but you've got to have the setup. And you've got to decide how you're going to approach that line. Now, do you fish chop worm and squat and castor and maggot and what do you do? Well, for a start off, I won't be fishing chop worm and I won't be fishing squat. That is a certainty. Not when I'm fishing individually, I'm fishing to win that match. And really, I've, either, I've got to make my mind up whether I'm going to fish big maggot or whether I'm going to fish hemp and castor. Most of the time, what I prefer to do is, is fish hemp and castor on the long pole. I think that that's a very positive method. It's a canal that responds well to castor and I know that if I can get a good run of roach going that there'll be better fish and therefore I have a better, better chance of winning match. So between the two lines I'm going to alternate through the day and hopefully pick a few fish on the far line, on the far bank and some on the long pole. So my setup for the pole is quite simple this. All I do is a basic setup I might have two rigs made up, one bigger than the other. If I come to the canal and it's flat calm, I'll probably have a 4x16s and a 4x18s on. 
If it's a bit windy, then I'll have a 4B18s and a 1 gram on. And that's the two types of floats, but the style and everything is the same. So let's go through the, the rigs. First of all, the elastic. Top two is elasticated. I have a number four elastic going through the top two. It's fixed at, at the bottom end with a small, neat bung that goes in goes in the bottom like that. I don't like the bungs with bits of line on that you can't actually get your number three section in a nice firm bit of plastic and the next section goes over the top. At the other end I've got a nice internal little bush, PTFE bush, that acts like a little bar of slope, so makes the elastic come out nice and smooth with a nice fine super stompo on the end. But like I said that's to a number four elastic. I don't think you want anything too fine because if you have one too fine what you find out is you bump a lot of fish, you don't actually set the hook and that's quite important. A lot of people complain to me that they lose fish with, with, uh, with casting and what I find out is that they're using too light elastic. So a nice number four. Because you've got elastic running through the centre pole sometimes you can get a bit of friction and where the elastic doesn't come out. I know we've seen all this happen when you've been fishing a while and the elastic is actually hanging down like that. Well, that's my pet hate. I hate that one. And when I see it hanging down like that, it really annoys me. So what we've got to do is use some kind of lubricant inside the pole. And there's quite a lot on the market. You can use washing up liquid. There's one or two other makes that you can use. But one or two of them does swell the elastic and it stops the elastic coming out. If you ask your local tattle dealer, I'm sure they'll tell you which ones don't don't work and swell the elastic. What I use is I get something from a garage. It's called Son of a Gun. Comes in a nice little spray like that. And all you do is spray quite a bit inside, like that. Let it run inside, put your bung back in. Just give it a quick shake, give it a couple of seconds and you'll find out it'll run through and it'll lubricate all the inside. And then what you find out is the elastic will come out nice and smooth the whole time. It does make a difference. I can show you, you must lubricate the inside of the pole. It does make a difference. What you might also find is that during the day when you've been fishing, it'll wear away and you see it hanging down again. Just lubricate it again. It only takes a few seconds and it does make an advantage. So when I'm fishing on this line, what I, what I generally use, because I'm fishing for roach, I use an old 10 hook length, which is, which is quite straightforward. The float I use is a is a lake style float where the, with an ordinary plastic bristle, I find that's quite important, like a plastic bristle, where it's narrow towards the, the bottom of the bristle. Just a lake style float. Carbon stem, doesn't really matter whether it's carbon or steel in this particular case, but I use a carbon stem. If it's very windy and I need a bigger float, what I will do, I will have a, a steel stem on and what you find out that acts more of a stabiliser. Down onto the terminal part of the tattle, which of course is the nitty gritty. It's quite straightforward. All I do, about a yard away from the hook, I have my bulk shot. I have a little string of shot like so, but where most of the bulk is taken. And that's about a yard away from the hook. And I find that what I do, a lot of people, what they do, they put all the shot together. But what you do with it, if you put all the shot together, you create like a little bar in your, in your line and it actually quite rigid. So what I do, I'll, I'll put a little gap of perhaps quarter to half an inch in between each shot and when it acts then it acts nice and smooth and it, you can actually nearly round it off and it works pretty well and I find that that is a better system. Below that I just have four droppers. All they are is two number 10s, a number 11 and a number 12 and they're evenly spread out between your bolt shot and your hook. I use an 08 hook length and I use a size 20 or an 18 when I'm really bagging, and that is to an 08 hook length. And that is the basic rig that I'm going to be using on the canal. When I plumb the depth, I'll find out, you'll find out that I'll be fishing roughly eight or nine inches over depth, so I'm actually laying that caster on the bottom. Uh, I don't want to be off the bottom, I want to make sure that I plumb it quite tight and that the, my hook and my bait is nine inches on the bottom. And that's the basic setup that I'll be fishing on the pole on the canal. The different baits that we have vary from section to section, but of course I'm trying to win a competition, I'm trying to win the match. So when I'm fishing for bream on the kiwi section, what I'll be using in the ground bait feeder is I'll be using a few mixed pinkies, I have a mixture and I just mix them in with my, with my feeder. I have a few squats, which I mix in, in with my up bait, which is usually a red maggot, maybe a bronze maggot as well. So I'll mix those three into my ground bait in my feeder. And on the hook, I'll have double red maggot, single red maggot, or when the bream do move in, I use single red worm in conjunction with a, 
uh, a pinky on the hook or a red maggie or even a caster at times. A sprinkler caster is also, I'm a big believer in bream fishing that you should put quite a few different things in and I find out that the fish will sort out exactly what they want. On the hook I just have double red maggot, single red or a worm and a caster and I find that works pretty well. On the new junction it's a little bit different because first of all when I'm fishing positively I won't need squats and pinkies so they can go away. The worms can go away because I won't need them unless I'm on the bream section. And all I'm going to be fishing when I'm fishing very positively is straight, simple, hemp, casters and big maggots. That's what I call a positive frame of mind. I'm trying to win the competition. I don't want no squats or no pinkies. All I'm going to be doing on my far line, on my far bank, I'm going to be feeding maggots. And on my pole line, I'll be fishing casters and hemp. And those are the only baits that I'll need today. Right, a minute to go before we start the match and what we're trying to do now is just make sure we've got everything right. We've got all this tackle ready, we've got all this bait ready. Prepare now for this ground bait bombardment which is the first thing we do when we start. But before you do that, you get your ground bait that you mixed, tip it onto a riddle, like so, and just run it through. And what that does, it gets all the lumps out and it, it airs the ground bait, makes it a bit fluffy, you get a few lumps on top. Just push them through with your hand like so, just make sure that they all go through. Because you're making it like this, it makes it nice and smooth, puts a nice carpet on the bottom for the fish to come onto. If you've got any bits of lumps on the top, just throw them away like so. That's nice and fluffy and you can actually feel the texture is a lot different and that's what you want when you're boiling up. In that ground bait now, what I'm going to do, because I'm going to be fishing on that line with hemp and casters, I'm going to put a few into the ground bait. I'm just going to get a bit of hemp, mix it in like that, a few casters, not too many, just like that, and just mix them in. Right, the, the match has started. First thing we've got to do is to put his ground, ground bait bombardment in and make it area for the fish to come on. First thing you must do is put your float out and make sure that the canal is not pulling because you mustn't feed when it's pulling because on this canal it pulls one way then the other quite, quite hard. At the moment it's stood, quite lucky. So all I'm going to do, I've got the balls made up. I'm going to pick them up, feeding them at the end of the pole. That's covered a nice area. What you find out is I put them for the went in quite nice. If you get one that don't go in quite right, goes a bit short or a bit further, put another one in. I like to put four in and make sure that I've got four balls in there. I'm pretty confident that's a nice little area that I'm going to fish in. It's not too bad if they're actually a bit shorter, but what you don't want them to do is go past your stuff. And I'm quite happy about that line now. That line now, I've got my bombardment in. The only thing I'm going to do on that line now is feed it, because I'm not going to fish it for perhaps an hour, maybe even two hours because what I'm going to do now, I'm going to start on the feeder. But that line, the whole time, what I will be doing when I'm fishing the feeder, I'll be putting 12 grains of hemp in, like so. Just feed it on that line and about 12 casters. Now this is not your normal, typical canal where uh, you might be fishing two or three casters in, in, in a shallow canal. It's quite a deep canal. There's a lot of tremendous head of fishing here. So I'm going to be fishing it quite heavy on that line. And every five minutes, I'll be, even though I'm sat on the feeder fishing, I'll be putting 12 grains of hemp and roughly 12 casters on that line. And all I'm trying to do is encourage fish onto that ground bait line where I'm going to catch them on the pole later on. Well, hopefully, I'm building my weight up on the feeder. Now, when I go on the feeder at the start of the match, I must remember to keep feeding that pole line throughout the time before I go on it. But the main line of attack now is the far bank. First of all, I've got to look at the conditions. What's the wind doing? At the moment, the wind is going down to the canal. And I know for a start off that I'm not going to be able to get my loose feed across there. But I always try. So just put a few maggots in, a, in your catapult like so. Just fire them up in the air to see how far you can get them across. Now I can just get them perhaps two thirds. Now that's not far enough for chub. Might catch a few roach on that line. So really, unless the wind changes and come further off my back, I'm not even going to try to feed that line. But you must. What keep your eye on the conditions to, to find out to see whether you can get your maggots out there. So it looks like it's going to be a case of fishing the feeder and if the wind dies down a little bit, casting the waggler on top of where my feeder's been going. Because we've had a few changes over the years on the canal, because a lot of the banks have been stoned, you've got the 
looking for a spot on the far bank that you might be able to cast. This particular area I've, I've drawn, you find out what's happened is that the reeds have started growing again. And I know in these areas the chub have actually started moving back into them. So what I'm looking for is a spot that's basically in front of me, but in between the reeds where I can actually cast my feeder right into, because it's important if I'm going to catch a chub, that it's going to be right into them reeds. So I find a little spot that I think is quite nice, it's just to the left of me a little bit um, and it's in the middle of the reeds. I've got the gear and the up length on for it, if I hook a chub I'm going to get it out, I'm quite happy about that. So all I've got to do now is bait up and cast down. And that hook bait, which I've got there is double, I might even try a single maggot, double red maggot or single red maggot and I'll, I'll change them throughout the day to find out what baits I want. Then what I do, I open my feeder up and I fill it to start with with maggots. Just put it in like that to the top, put the lid back on. Now the important part, I've got to try and get it as near into them reeds as I can get it. Don't worry if I go too far sometimes, and that's going to happen, I know that. Look behind you, make sure there's no snags. Cast it out, about a yard short, almost perfect. Just sink your line. If your line doesn't sink, what I tend to do it's put some washing up liquid. It's important, you don't want to be dragging it back the whole time. When it hits the bottom, you want to be tightening straight up onto it. Like, that way you, can, you get a bite straight. Because it's amazing sometimes that you can catch chub straight away. So all I do sometimes, I put a bit of washing up liquid onto the spool. Now you might have noticed that I've actually used my rod hold all as a rod rest. And that's simply because on these banks, it's a lovely bank here, it's, it's basically straight and you're not up and down stones. So all we do, we put a road all as a rod rest. Further up, further downstream where it's all stones and everything like that, then you've got to use a rod rest. But I find that just put the rod on the rod hold all and it works perfectly. I like my tip, I like to fish the tip this way, the right hand way. The reason why I like to do that is I feel more comfortable. I have the rod going downstream, I try and get the rod angle about 90 degrees to where the feed is actually going and I'm, because I'm right handed the rod and my arm is in a straight line to the water. So even though you're sat here on the feeder now attacking that far line, you must keep your, your eye on the conditions. See if the wind's dropped, has it increased or whatever, because at the end of the day if you can feed over there, you lose feed, you'll certainly get a few more fish on the waggle. At the moment there's no way I'm still going to get over there. But you've still got another line to consider anyway and that's your pole line. So you must keep feeding it. Now one of the reasons why I actually fish, or I like to fish the feeder, down the right hand side like so is one, I can actually see the tip better that way. I'm right handed and the rod is directly in front of me like so. And I know that I quite easily I can pick up and, and strike if I need to strike. If I'm facing the other way, I find that the rod is across me and I can't strike the same. But more importantly than that, I actually feed with a catapult in my left hand. So I can actually leave the rod on my knee, on the rod, rod rest, and feed. So if I get a bite, I can pick the rod up very quickly and pick it up. But if I want to feed my pole line, I'm not touching the rod. I can just pick the pouch up, put 12 grains of hemp in. I'm still looking at my tip. Feed it out on my pole line. 12 pieces, or 12 casters, and put it on the same line. And I haven't even I'll sit straight on my pole line, put that down, I can put the rod then onto my rod, onto my rod and then my rod has not moved. It's been perfect in the whole position. That's why I like to fish it that way. There we go. Now first thing you do when you look into a fish, determine what you think it might be. If it's a chub you'll know straight away because we're trying to get it roots into it. But this is not a chub, this is either a perch or a skimmer. When it moves into the middle of the canal, pull it out. Feels like one of them nice perch. It feels a good fish. You don't be too aggressive with it. Just be a bit careful. It comes to the top. It's doing some fighting. Oh, look at that for a perch. It's a cracker, that one. Hey, oh, where's my net? There we go, my beauty. Hey, hey. No, you're not really bothered about catching many chub when you're catching perch that big. That's 12 ounce, that one. That's a nice fish. 
Now that's a bonny fish that. That's 10 or 12 ounce, that's a lovely fish, that's a nice start. There we go. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to bring it in, I'm going to have a, a look on the pole line and just to see if I get a response. Then if I don't get a response I'll go back on the feeder and I'd expect to catch a couple of fish fairly quickly after I've given it a rest. So that's what I'll do, I'll pick it up now and have a go on the pole. Now you might have noticed that I'm sat at an angle with my tip. My tip is at an angle. Now I don't, first time I go on the pole, I like to fish it squared onto the pole. First time I go on it, I never move it because I don't want to spoil the way that I'm set up to fish the feeder. So to start with, what I'll do, put everything in position, and I'll still fish it from this angle so I'm not moving my box about the whole time. Now all I'm going to do, ship it out and see what happens. Now if I get a quick response, it could mean the difference between winning and not winning the match, because sometimes they do come early. I'll ship it out, put it on the spot, like so. First time in, I won't feed anything. I'm not going to feed anything first time in, because I'm, I want to see if I get a response, and if I feel as though if I'm going to put any more casters in, it might just spoil that response. If you're going to get one, sometimes it can go under straight away and you get one pretty quick. Now that's, that's a bite. Ooh, missed it. That went straight under, so that's a nice sign. I got one first cast, or I had a bite first cast. Bring the caster in, let's have a look at the caster. No, that's not really much. The hook's pulled out the shell, and so I've got to change the caster. Now in my head, what I'm thinking about now is, how long do I keep that feeder line? The fish have got used to uh, them maggots on that feeder going in. I don't want to leave it too long. I've got to make a decision at some time of whether I go on it pretty soon again or not. Because at the end of the day, I'm still feeding this, this line on the pole. Now, when I've had a couple of chucks and, a few, and I realise a few fish there, what I'll do now is I'll feed it. No, I wonder what this is. Oh, I'm going to tangle it back there. Oh, it's a roach. I knew they wouldn't be long before they could resist them hemp and casters. Now, this is what I've said about fishing a positive match. Now I've been on the feeder, caught a few fish, all right, I ain't caught my chub, but I've had two pound plus of skimmers and perch. But these are what I'm looking for, these are, cast, these are caster roach. Six, eight, ten ounce fish, that's a six ounce fish, nice plump roach. And you know eventually that these are going to move in onto the caster and hemp line. And then what I've got to do, I've got to alternate between the caster and the hemp, because you can catch on both baits. At the moment, I'm going to keep trying the caster and see if I can get a few more fish. Once you've got a roach or one or two roach and you've actually got them feeding on that line, then you can start thinking, I've got a good chance. How long has the match got to go? How long will it go? The longer the match goes on, the more you can expect to catch on the caster and the hemp on the pole line. That's quite important because it will and should get stronger during the latter parties of the matches. The only thing I would be a little bit wary of is the fact that I know in my mind that the last 15 to 20 minutes is the best time for chub. And I'm, you're wondering then whether to have a, a quick chub later on. And I've got to determine the weight I've got in my mat, in the keep net, to whether I can get in the money or win the match. And whether I need to fish for a chub or just continue to catch roach on the pole. If they keep coming like they're coming at the moment, then all I will do, I'll keep catching roach on the pole and, and not even think about chub. Another day, another peg. Same designer clothes, but different tactics, as Tom now guides us through some choice tips for a team approach to match angling. The main attack for team fishing on the canal is squat fishing. 
That's what most teams base it on nowadays. And it's so important that you've got to get two things right. One is the, the right distance out from the bank that you're actually going to fish. You don't want to fish too long, you don't want to fish too short. It's important that you get the right distance out from the bank. Remember, the first thing you do when you get to the bank is mix your ground bait. As you probably know, ground bait absorbs a bit of water and you might just have to add a bit more water before the match commences. But it's all the first thing that you do. From that, we've got other baits that we're going to be using. And what we've got, we've got first of all, we've got worms, which I'll be using my chop worm line. I have two types of worm. I have a small red worm, which I use for the hook. And then I have, well, in this case, I've got dendrobenas. I don't think it really matters whether it's lob worm, red worm, or dendrobenas, which we're going to chop up and, uh, and as a, an attractor. So that's two types of baits I'm going to be using. It is important for the up bait that you have the small red type. And I like to have a mixture. I like to have some of it bigger than the others. I like some right little ones and a nice mixture. I think that's important so you can actually uh, you know, have a change of bait. Then I've got hemp seed, which on this canal, because it's uh, a lot of roach in the system, uh, the hemp seed is very, very important. In conjunction with the squat, you can do two things. First, it attracts roach into your swim. And secondly, you can catch on the hemp as well, especially in the latter stages of a competition or a pleasure session, you have to catch on the hemp. Then I've got bronze maggots uh, with, with a few red mixed in. They're for, for me roach and eels. Um, in the summertime, you'll find out that I'll be fishing long to catch one or maybe two eels, like I said earlier, but maybe even occasional roach. But I'll be fishing that long, I'll not be expecting in the summer to catch many roach. When it comes into the autumn in September and October, then I would expect to catch more roach. But they, at the moment, I class that as my eel bait. I also carry a mixture of pinkies, all different red, whites and, and disco ones. That is more, more often than not for perch, because when I'm fishing the chop worm line, I will occasionally put a pinky on to try and catch a, a bonus perch or just a change of bait as much as anything. So them's a few of the baits, but the main bait is a squat. And in any team match, squat fishing on this canal is the most important. I'm going to start on the chop worm line because I feel that that's the best way of getting, getting early fish before my squat line starts to work. So what I'm looking for now is a nice little red worm. There we go, that's the one. Just put, hook it like so. Drop it in on your, on your area, like so. Just drop it in, let it go straight to the bottom. And you can see why now I have all the shot in the bottom two foot because I'll be twitching the bait the whole time. Just let it settle, give it 15, 20 seconds or something like that. And if I don't get a bite straight away, if a fish hasn't come straight to it, I've got to encourage a perch to, to take. And a perch is a predator fish, it will chase things. So all I do then, I just pull it an inch at a time, just little quick jerks like so, just try and encourage a perch to take it. Do it five or six times, then leave it. And it's gone under again like that. Just count to about five, like so, and strike into it like that. Oh, and that's not a bad fish, that. And before elastics come out, I've actually looked a good and first cast. Now, I can't remember catching a big roach on chop worm on here. And look at that. I'm supposed to be catching perch, and I've caught a roach 12 ounce to a pound. Now, that, <laughs> that never happens normally, believe it or not. I don't think I've ever done that before. But that's typically this canal practicing. And I've got a beautiful red fin. Look at that. What better fishing than that do you want to get? It's absolutely super that. And just to prove it, look, there's my chop worm. So I'm not telling no fibs. When I go in this time, I'm going to feed my other line, my squat line. Because I've got to start thinking about something else. Because I know from experience that this won't last long. So what I do this time, I drop it in on my spot, put the pole there, pick my catapult up. I get 12 grains of hemp, like so, and I'm going to fire them on my 8 meter line, uh, sorry, my 10 meter line where my squat line is, like so. Then, about a dozen maggots, a dozen squats, sorry, and I'm going to fire them on the same spot. Now, every couple of minutes I've got to do that. What I'm looking for is a, is a continuation of bait flowing through. At the same time, not forgetting this line, so one, two, I'm twitching it the whole time, moving that bait, trying to encourage perch all the time. And at the same time, thinking about the other lines. And what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to work three swims at the same time. Now, that's not an easy thing to do, but in team fishing, you've got to be able to, well, you've got to learn to feed three. If you can't feed three, then you've got to pick two. 
you've got to feed to. It's no good doing something that you can't do. So if you can't feed three, feed two. And the one to knock out generally, I think, is a chop worm line. I would, oh, the squat line is the number one, and I always think the maggot line is the number two. And then your chop worm line is number three. But if you can feed all three, it's a bonus. I'm not saying you'll catch fish on all three, but you've always got an option to try later on. Even though I might not be catching so many fish on the chop worm line, it's something I can always come back to later on. Now, I think we're struggling on that now. I think it's time for a change. Right, we'll pick a squat rig up. Now the squat rig, I'm going to start off with 4 with 16 float. Because again, I think you can always do that to start with. So I'm going to go in with the 4 with 16s. First thing I'm, I'm going to do before I fish, I'm going to lubricate my elastics to make sure that they are right. There we go. I know they're right now. Lubricated. I know they'll work nice and perfect. There you go. Now then, this is a bit different. This because you're going to lay the tattle on the water differently to the you do with a chop worm. With a chop worm, I wanted it to go straight down to the bottom. Now this squat line is a bit different. I'm going to a 24 on to start with. Right, so all I'm, <coughs> I'm going to do the same as the worm. I'm looking for a squat which I would, which I fancy myself, and it's surely the big ones that stand out. And you just see one, you think that's the one. Put it on. Sometimes you can usually start off by fishing one, but sometimes you later on in the match when the bigger fish are moving in, you'll probably fish two, and that is a good bait on this canal. Is double squat. So I'll put one squat on. Lay your tackle in the water. Ship your pole back out. Now this is different. I'm going to do this differently to the chop worm. The chop worm, I dropped it straight down. On the squat, what I'm actually going to do, I'm going to lay it so it goes sideways on the canal like so. And it's going to be sideways over my ground bait. So when I lay my tackle, the float and the hook is about, the ground bait is actually 50, halfway down between my hook and my float. So it's actually dropping when it meets on top of my ground bait. The reason why I don't go that way is because I'm going in deeper water. So I ship it out to the end of the pole and I lay it like so. So that my float is this side of my ground bait, my hook is that side, but when they meet, they'll meet in the middle. And now you can see my float working and registering to the shot. It's each the bottom and I can see my shot dotted down to the bristle. You can hardly see my bristle on my float, that is quite important. I want it really dotted down so there's only a quarter of an inch or, and it's gone straight under, gone straight into a fish. Now that, you can't get that any better. You ship the pole behind me, take your time, and this feels like a perch. There it is, look. That's probably why I want catching them on, on the chop worm, they probably want the squat today, which, which does happen sometimes. They don't want the chop worm, they want the squat. And that's straight on single squat. Now these are the fish, you expect to catch normally straight away on the squat is a few perch. Once you started uh, on your squat line, it's important to keep feeding a bit of hemp, 12 grains and 12 grains of squats. And I tend to, to put them in almost every cast. And like I said, it's only later in the match because when I first squat on it, I expect to get quite a few bites. And all I do is keep feeding, keep that bait going through all the time. If you stop it, it's amazing you soon lose the fish. You sit there and your bites will come, generally, because it's just settled. And all you do, if you don't have one pretty soon, you don't sit there waiting for something to happen. Try and make something happen. Just lift your bait and move your float about a foot. Hold it straight down. Hold it and it'll drop again through all that bait falling through. And hopefully, that's when I catch the biggest roach on the canal. I don't know what it is about it. I don't seem to get them when it drops the first time. It's as though you're just pulling it away from them and they're not letting it go. Now, of course, I've got a, a big maggot line as well that I'm fishing. <coughs> I'm fishing at between 13 and 14 and a half metres. And I haven't got to forget about that because that's an Im important part of the, of the match. So every so often, every 10 minutes or so, I'll put a little pouch full of maggots in on that line, ready for when I go on it. And I keep doing that as a tempter, because I really won't 
concentrate on it until I want to go on it. And again, a bit like the chop worm line, what you've got to decide you're going to do is five minutes before you go on it, <coughs> you've got to decide that I'm going to feed it. And you start feeding it a little bit more regular than you do. There we go. Perch, look. All perch are out today, which can happen on here. Either that or they just want the squat. Now this time I'm going to feed them, big, instead of feeding me squat and me hemp line, this cast, what I'm going to do, I'm going to feed them big maggot line. You don't really want to do a lot together. So every so often, every 10 minutes, I neglect my squat line and I just get a little pouch full of maggots and I try and aim with 14 metres is, and I feed that on that line and I've done with that for 10 minutes or so. But it's important you don't forget about it and concentrate on my squat line and only when I'm going to go on my big maggot line, do I start upping it a little bit? And what I might do is feed it every two or three minutes instead of every ten minutes and build it up. So eventually, when I pick that long line up, or the eel line, or the maggot, big maggot line, whichever we want to call it, I expect it to go straight under first cast. So all the time, even though I'm fishing one line, I'm thinking about my other lines. And that's important because I expect to catch fish off every one of them. That's gone straight under. As soon as I move the float, then it went straight under. Now at the moment, I'm getting pestered with perch. My roach are not in. But that's that's normal, that, because when you fish start, you normally do catch perch. So this time, instead of feeding me a big maggot line, lay my bait across and back to the hemp. One of the reasons why we feed hemp is basically because roach love it. And, and you can't really get in, in the money on, in a match on here with perch. So that's why you're trying to feed the perch. I don't mind getting a few to start with. But generally you, you must have the roach. And that's why you feed the hemp. The, the light, look at that, straight away. Ah, here's what we want. Now this is a typical canal roach. Inch, ounce and a half, little plump fish, and then what you'll catch to start with, they're little weighers them, they're what you want. And then eventually, you'll, as the match goes on, you hopefully get them three, four, five ounce. But to start with them, you can get some tiny fish this big, uh, that are a lot smaller than that. And there is areas in the canal where you, you get pestered by them. And I'll be honest with you, you've got to catch them because generally <coughs> what happens is, is the fact that they tend to, the size of the fish are in areas. And if you're on a show little fish, you can't seem to get bigger fish. They always seem to be smaller fish. So just don't worry about it, just get on with it. Because where there's smaller fish, there's only more of them anyway. Right, what happens during a competition, you find out that on the squat line, the fish will come and they'll go. And you've got to keep feeding that line, but also feed your big maggot line and when you think you're going to go on the big maggot line about 10 minutes before just start feeding a little bit more regular with the bronze maggots so that when you're going to pick that line that line that tackle up you know and I would expect to bite first or second cast and if you're going to get one that's your best time of catching one practicing is a bit different you're allowed to catch roach and all kinds of things but in a match I can assure you it don't work that way and uh, so what you've got to do is just pick it up and be a little bit more patient so what I'm going to do, I'm going to have a little look on the, on the big maggot line now. I'm going to fish single maggot on that little 24 hook and that 4 elastic and we'll see what happens. But I've been feeding it quite regularly so I'm expecting again a bite first cast. <coughs> now the first thing you do is pick a maggot you like, a nice bronze one. I don't necessarily, although I've got a few reds scattered in, I don't normally go in with the red one. Nice bronze one. Just nick it through like so, one I'd fancy myself. And basically what I'm going to do now, I'm going to lay the tattle in on the same way as I would the squat. I'm going to do it that way. I don't want it to go out, I want it to be sideways. On the same spot as I've been able to feed maggots. I ship it out 14 and a half metres. Now sometimes you might find, because the canal is quite open, you might get a very strong wind on. If there's a strong wind, you can fish at 13 metres. That's one of the ideas of, of spreading the bait around. Lower it in. One of the best times to go on, 
on the, on the eel line, I find, is because the, the canal tolls one way and then the other, and it's quite, it's quite important to be, to be fishing when it's stood. So one of the times that I find you can actually go on, on the eel line is when it's been running and it starts to slow. Because when it starts to slow, you know you're going to get quite a, a long period actually trying to catch an eel. You know that it ain't going to run for perhaps another five or ten minutes so you can actually have a good cast. Now that went straight under. Now would you believe it, I've caught a roach. About right, isn't it? Not big maggot. Look at that. <laughs> we, never, we never see these in matches. <laughs> Come here, my beauty. <laughs> Typical. Where are you in matches? We never see these. A uh, nice plump redfin, six ounce. Not maggot. That took it on the on the drop. Single maggot. I'll have one more cast without feeding, then we'll feed it again. Lower it in. Now what you what, one thing you might find out, as you probably see now, there's quite a bit of wind on the water. When there's quite a bit of wind on the water, you find out sometimes when it's going across you, you find out that it blows your float away from you. And if it blows your float away from you, you find out that your, your tattle is going out and it tends to be off the bottom. So when it's like that, what I do, I grab the section, I fish the pole halfway up a section, like so. I'm actually fishing it halfway up at the moment. Because if it does move past the rod tip then, I know it's still on my baited area. And it's not going to be, the bait's not going to be in mid-water, which is, you don't want that because you'll never catch a fish. You want the bait on the bottom, or near the bottom. But you must only feed when the canal's stood. If it's pulling, don't feed. Because what happens is when, when the canal is pulling and you feed, you spread the fish all over the place and you want to try and concentrate them in, in one area. So it's important that even if it's pulling, don't feed, not even hemp. Now at the moment the canal is stood. And this is a time I'd expect I'm going to catch an eel to catch one. Now during a, a five hour competition, I might expect to go on this line four or five times during that time. Again, at all time, <laughs> even though I'm fishing out there, the main line is the squat line. So I'm feeding emp and squats, so even fishing 14 and a half metres, I've got, even, if I, even if I can't hold it and it's windy, I would still put the pole down to, fish, to feed that line, because I know that that's the most important line that I've got. And it's the line I have to concentrate on more than any other line. So even when I'm having one of my spells on the big maggot, I will still keep feeding that squat line the whole time. Now this maggot line is the only line where I wouldn't work the bait. Now what I mean by that is I would let the, the bait just hang looking to catch an eel on the bottom. I wouldn't be pulling it, I wouldn't be twitching it, I wouldn't be doing anything. I'd just cast it in and leave it. And I'd just be waiting for an eel to pick it up and move about. Generally what I tend to do as well is the times when I do my changing, when I change from one method to another, are the times when the canal pulls. If I was on the long pole as I am at now as an example, and I'd been on it for a while and not caught anything, and all of a sudden it started to pull, what I would do then is change. And I'd, I'd pull this in, I'd put the squat line up, ready for when it slowed down and I'd expect to catch bites immediately it slowed down. So while it's pulling, that's the time I wouldn't expect to catch any fish at all. Between the float and the pole tip, I put a shot. You have to take a shot from your terminal tattle, which I just take one off my bulk area, and I put it three or four inches above the float, in between the float and the pole tip. And what that does Instead of the wind blowing your line round and unsettling the balance on your float, is it sinks your line between your pole tip and your float and it holds it stable and it just slows it down fractionally to get bites. 
So that's quite important because you'd have to do that a lot on this canal as you find in a lot of places throughout the country it's quite important. A lot of people don't use back shots enough and all it does is it just sinks the line at the back of the pole float and it just steadies the float. But you must take a shot off from your terminal tat otherwise your float will sink because it still registers on your float. So I've just done that because it's got quite windy and it's made it more stable and, and it is better. But although you're fishing that line, don't neglect your other lines. So you must keep feeding your squats and your hemp. So I've just put that back shot on now and what's that? It's just sank the line at the back of the float and it's just holding it nice and steady even with that wind. It's just working quite well. It means as well that you can actually put your pole tip closer to the water. You can actually put it closer to the water so the wind doesn't affect it at all. And like I said earlier, you will find that you'll have to do that a lot on this canal. Right, what happens is, <coughs> during the, the later end, the first three hours, you can normally get a few bites on the squat. But all the time I'm feeding squat and I'm feeding hemp. But what you find out is on the canal, there's a lot of fish to be caught on the hemp at certain times of the year. And at some stage, I want to be putting hemp on the hook to find out any bigger quality fish on that line. And as soon as I get a blank period on the squat, what I'll do then is try a piece. Just put one on and I, I actually put it on my squat rig. Because the squat is on the bottom, or the, the line is on the bottom, it doesn't really matter. So all I'm going to do, first of all, I'm going to pick a piece of hemp out that I, that I think is a nice piece. So you get your hemp, you go through it. Now what I'm looking for is a piece that I'd fancy. And if you look, I'm looking at him now, and I'm looking for a piece that's got a bit of white showing it, showing, like that one. Quite a big piece, I look for quite a big piece again. Now when you look at, look at it, at one end it's got a brown bit and a pointed bit on the other end, opposite the, the split. Now at the brown end, just there, what I do then, I get a pole float, like so, and I just put it in the soft bit and I just pierce it, like so, about eight through an inch, and it actually, you can actually leave it on the, on the pole float. Well that does it, it gives a little hole. Then pull the, the pole float out, put it down, get your hook, and then if you put the hook in the brown bit, it'll actually thread through and come out the white. And it shouldn't do. That's it, like that. And what you find then is you've got a piece of hemp on your hook and it's held together by a little piece of the shell. And if you have problems with the normal conventional way of putting hemp on, always coming off, which I do, that is the way to do it. And I always fish hemp that way. I don't, you know, I don't try and say that I'm a great hemp angler or, or anything like that. But I find since I've started doing it that way, I can catch more fish, I don't miss as many bites, and I don't lose as much hemp, which has always been a problem for me, and one of the problems that's always put me off it. That's the way to put the hemp on the hook. I find that better for me. Once it's on the hook, all you do, you ship out. Now if this goes under, you can expect a nice day's fishing after that, because usually, with the hemp, you find out that if you're gonna catch one, it'll generally go under straight away. Same line as you've been fishing. Just feed, feed a few grains. And what I tend to do then, if I get a bite very quickly, and I, or I get a couple of fish, what I'll do then, the rest of the match, I tend to start cutting down on the squat. Still putting a few in, but cutting it down a little bit and in introducing a little bit more hemp. Because towards the last hour, I would expect to catch a few more better roach. And usually the hemp is a very good bait on this, this water. They don't always come on the hemp. And if they don't, just change it again and put squat back on. But at least it's giving you a swim a rest and try something different, try something a bit more positive. So you haven't had a bite then, and usually if you're gonna catch one, you usually get it pretty quick, the first one. So I would perhaps have, I've had one cast there where I thought it was a, a decent cast. I'd, I'd lift it and drop it in again. And if I don't get a bite this cast, I would change back then to squat. And at the same time, I would keep feeding. But if I did, if I did catch a fish on it, then I would straight away probably start introducing not more hemp but I'd cut down on the squat. 
and of course the other sign to let you know there's a... how about that then eh? got one first cast on the hemp or second cast I should say there we go now what a lot of some anglers do on the canal system what they tend to do they'll have a, <coughs> a hemp rig already made up and once they've caught one or two fish on the the squat rig that they've adapted then they would change to the hemp rig it don't particularly bother me to be perfect honest with you. one thing i do insist when i'm fishing is that when you're weighing and you're throwing the fish up the net like so while they're still in the water and when they're near the top of the ring and you bring them out now that is a cracking day's fishing you can see the size of fish they're like between an ounce and up to 12 ounce fish to perch on the chop worm. That's a lovely day's fishing, a few good you know, There's a mixed variety of fish caught, some on the squat line, some on the chop worm, and some on the big maggot. So all three lines worked. Only thing we didn't catch, we didn't catch an eel, which is a bit unfortunate, but that's the way it goes. So I'll put these to fight to back in the water to fight another day and give somebody else a lovely day's fishing like I've had. <laughs>